Well, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight for uh, the webinar uh, that we are um, here tonight to discuss uh, the better angels and to actually discuss how to be able to move the National Infrastructure Bank forward uh, in this next Congress and hopefully get it adopted in the first 100 days uh, so that uh, the solution that we all believe is very important to this country uh, gets started uh, on its way to be able to resolve what needs to happen. My name is Robert Lynn, and I'm a retired organizer for the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters, Local 50, and here in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, some of the things that we're going to be discussing today uh, are visible on your screen. One of the things that we talked about was the <clears throat> we're going to be discussing is what you can do personally to be able to help us be able to make this uh, process possible. One of the things that's really important is to be able to understand where you are, your friends, and, and people who you have influence over to be able to make that happen, uh, to, to be able to <clears throat> hopefully be able to get this idea in front of them, uh, get them to buy in, and hopefully for them to then be able to grow this. In other words, what we're trying to do is build the parade so that we can actually get this across the finish line today. Uh, we have a number of speakers that we're going to be uh, presenting today uh, from a very background. We have uh, representatives, both from the local, state, uh, local and state level, as well as labor leaders uh, who are uh, representative of <clears throat> many different uh, unions and also from many different areas of the United States. This bank is very much about uh, the answer to be able to hopefully uh, address the, the economic uh, mm. turmoil that a lot of our citizens are facing. Uh, right now, it, it is a time when people are just <clears throat> feeling uh, a great sense of <clears throat> unease about what's going on. And so hopefully uh, this here, uh, coupled with the solution that uh, the Biden administration has talked about for COVID relief and be able to address some of those ills. Hopefully this will be the economic engine needed in order to move things forward. Uh, with that, we're gonna to start to move on with our panelists to be able to talk about uh, how you can get involved and, and some of the steps that you can do. So that's gonna be the theme today. And our first speaker is Jack Hanna uh, from the Oregon Democratic Party Central Committee and a former interim chairman of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. So Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Again, my name is Jack Hanna and I also was a delegate to the 2020 Democratic National Convention uh, in addition to serving here in Oregon's uh, Democratic State Committee and formerly Pennsylvania's. Fellow Americans, today our country faces a crisis of huge proportions given the events of yesterday last week and last year. Let us remember under these trying circumstances that tomorrow is Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. And we have it as a reminder of his example and inspiration for us as we confront and work towards making our country a better union. But let us also remember that this is not the first crisis our country has faced and that there are many parallels to two other unique moments in our country's history. 160 years ago, Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated weeks before the start of the Civil War. Almost 90 years ago, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was sworn into office at the exact moment when over 70% of the United States banks were closed because of the financial panic of the Great Depression. Both presidents arose to the occasion and confronted the challenges that our country faced then, which were existential. I suggest to you that we today are in a similar situation, given the fact that we have over 10% unemployment, 4 million businesses having filled within the past year, and a pandemic that is now killing three to 4,000 people a day. 
History is an important tool in providing guidance to us, all for what we may or need do under similar circumstances. What problems and possible solutions did Lincoln, Roosevelt, and now President-elect Joe Biden all have in common in taking office as leaders of our nation? I suggest the common problems are these. A divided nation slowly. An economic crisis that demanded a financial tool to remedy the, cur the currently uh, uh, crisis that we face. Uh, three, the need for a sudden and immediate economic uh, stimulus to address the country's immediate needs. The common solution is a national infrastructure bank. Lincoln employed a national banking system to finance the country's needs for civil war conflict and also to build the transcontinental railroad. He was a great supporter of the concept of national banks from the beginning of his political career in the 1930s and throughout his presidency. We all know of his famous inaugural quote, which is the title of our today's webinar, The Better uh, Angels of Our Nature. Lincoln came to Washington in March of 1860, 1861 uh, for and at a time of great conflict, so much so that he had to travel incognito because of fear for his safety. A year later, during the war, he promoted legislation creating greenbacks that were supported financially by the government bonds secured by the treasury. In 1864, legislation was passed that created the controller of the currency, which survives today. It also created a network of national banks that financed the war debt and also construction of the great railroad system that uh, promoted and uh, uh, helped create America's industrial revolution. FDR faced a similar crisis. From 1929 to 1933, national income shrank by half. Home foreclosures quadrupled. 20% of children in the country didn't have enough to eat. Three times the number of people left the country as in compared to immigrating here. By March 3rd, the only banks that were open throughout the country were in New York City and Chicago. The day after March 4th, FB, FDR was inaugurated. On March 9th, legislation uh, offered by FDR for financing the Financial Reconstruction uh, Corporation uh, uh, was debated for five hours and passed by you know, uh, 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 great support from both parties. March 15th, after that, 70% of the banks reopened. The country recovered as a result of FDR's uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and uh, the rest is history. Conservative forces of the New Deal were that it saved and revived our banking system and our country by having a common goal to get the economy moving again. President Biden has uh, the country today, as the country today faces a similar circumstance, uh, uh, must uh, employ uh, and confront an aging infrastructure that's been ignored and not addressed in 60 years. An economy with huge numbers exceeding 10 million of people unemployed and underemployed. And last but not least, a political situation where there is so much divergence and literally conflicting differences that unity must occur. Today, I su suggest to you that the same leadership and the same economic policies, including a national infrastructure bank that were employed by Lincoln and FDR are relevant and I dare say a necessity to improve the economy for all aspects of our country. 
red states and blue, rural communities and urban, the best way to lead and unite the country at this moment is a common goal that is beyond partisanship and beyond politics, which is to have an, an economy that includes and supports all our country's citizens. We need and must have a national infrastructure bank desperately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next, uh, we're going, uh, before I go any further, what I'd like to, to tell everyone is there is a Q&A section or the chat box, either one, uh, that you could utilize um, on your screen. That way we can get any questions uh, that you might have and, and make sure we get them to the appropriate uh, presenters so that we can get an answer for you. And uh, uh, please don't hesitate to use that. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on and we're gonna ask Alfeka Mutardi, uh, the macroeconomist for the National Infrastructure Bank to be able to uh, <clears throat> give us a brief synopsis of what the bank is and, and where we are in terms of moving it forward. So Alfeka. Thank you very much and um, welcome to everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar this evening. So my name is Alfeka Mutardi and I'm a macroeconomist. Uh, what I do is follow budgets and um, banks and uh, the banking sector. And of course uh, in this COVID world, uh, following the economy very carefully in, in all the aspects that Jack Hanna just mentioned. What we're talking about today is a new proposal of an infrastructure bank uh, that would be ideal for uh, Joe Biden to pick up and Republicans as well to get us out of our, invent, uh, of our um, economic difficulties and to uh, build, uh, build out our um, infrastructure and economy much more broadly than has been done over the last 60 years. What we're talking about is HR 6422, uh, a bill introduced last March in 2020 uh, by Representative Danny Davis and with um, co-sponsor Seth Moulton from Massachusetts and um, um, Bobby Rush from Illinois, and I think also Debbie Dingell. Uh, what this bill would do would be to create an independent institution, a public bank that would be responsible for lending for infrastructure only. And on this iteration around for a public bank, what we did was ask ourselves the question, how, if we were not constrained by budgets, how much would we need? We went to the American Society of Civil Engineers who have just recently updated their estimations to say that we need some uh, 17 trillion, 13 trillion over a 20 year period uh, of which uh, 5.6 trillion is not funded by any other means. Uh, we started out our bank with a coverage of the next 10 years forward. So having that means that we, we, we need to cover with this infrastructure bank at least $3 trillion of unfinanced infrastructure needs that are not funded by any other means. And in addition, we wanna add on some other things like broad, um, a broad, uh, broadband, affordable housing and high-speed rail. So how does this bank work really quickly? Uh, the bank is capitalized by private holdings of treasuries. Uh, it pays out of the federal budget a little bit extra uh, for those, those private entities that uh, um, invest their treasuries with the National Infrastructure Bank, but is reimbursed out of the earnings of the National Infrastructure Bank back to the federal government. The reason for con configuring it this way is because uh, we wanted to attract both uh, the interest of Republicans and Democrats to support this bank, and the bank will be budget neutral, will not require new taxes like gas taxes or anything, and will not create any new federal debt. We think that spending upwards of $5 trillion to uh, finance all of the nation's infrastructure, that is infrastructure in every single category and every single geographic district in the, in the country will create up to 25 million jobs, great paying jobs, paying Davis-Bacon wages and will supercharge the American economy. So where are we now? Uh, we're now into a new session of Congress, the 117th session of Congress that started uh, this January and we'll need to reintroduce the bill. So um, we're working on that. Um, one important aspect of it is to uh, reflect the engineer's new estimates. So the size of the bank will be up to $5 trillion. 
And the other aspect is we're really looking for Republican co-sponsors. So in every single district, uh, we're able to show that every congressman's district will benefit from this bank. Uh, there's a backlog of infrastructure projects everywhere, especially in roads, bridges, and critical things that might break at any moment. Uh, we also need a lot of water projects to replace all the lead and water and that kind of thing. These are projects that are on the, the books and they're ready to go. And we will start with those projects right away. So we want to attract uh, both uh, a, a large um, uh, backing of uh, House Congress persons from both re the Republican and Democratic Party to, uh, to back this bill. And our next speakers are going to talk about specific ways that you can help to get these Congress persons to come on board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, one of the things that uh, <clears throat> we're going to do here today is, is really talk about how do we move this bill forward and how do we make sure that we get everybody on board to be able to make this happen. This is not just a, we don't want this, and this bill cannot be a Democratic bill or a, just a Republican bill. It needs to be in a bill for all of America. And that's what uh, we believe that this National Infrastructure Bank really addresses is the, the needs that are in every community throughout the United States. And, and it's really important that we keep that focus there. I'm going to ask Senator Lou De Palma now uh, from Rhode Island uh, to uh, share with us some of the ideas if you're a state legislator, or if you're trying to uh, be able to talk to your congressman or senator to be able to do that, some of the, the ideas uh, and focus that we can make sure this bill has going forward. So Senator De Palma, if you wouldn't mind, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob, and uh, welcome to everyone tonight listening in and listening uh, beyond this. Uh, your voice is important. You may think, well, they don't know who I am and I don't know who they are. Pick up the phone send them a letter. Regardless of what your role is, you wanna contact your state legislature, Senate, House, if you're unicameral, whoever your assembly person is. You wanna also contact your federal delegation. So I put my money where my mouth are, where my words are. I've done that in my state. I still have a call outstanding to, I need to make to one of my uh, congressmen. Uh, we have two congressmen and two senators in Rhode Island. And I've talked to my senators. I've talked to one of my congressmen. I need to talk to the other about their support uh, for this bill going forward. I've spoken with them in the past. Uh, if the time is ripe, the time is ripe right now for this bill to move over the goal line. Uh, Vice President-elect Biden has indicated infrastructure is a clear priority moving forward. This is certainly something that can happen immediately within the first 100 days. As articulated before, it's nothing new. It's been done before. And as Alfaca has very eloquently talked about, and there's even a graphic that she has that you can use to share with folks when you talk about a national infrastructure, what it is, and sit down and communicate to them, this is what it is, and this is what we need. But you wanna specifically ask, so via phone call, via letter, via email, to your federal delegation, representatives, senators, about doing that. You can also reach out to the Biden campaign. The Biden campaign, excuse me, the Biden administration, the campaign's over, the election's over. Uh, the, Biden, the Biden administration has transition team members. I've been on some of those calls. I've been on calls who, with folks who worked their campaign. And you probably have folks in your, each of your states that you can reach out to that you might be aware of. If you're unfamiliar with who they are, I encourage you to reach your local Democratic city committee or town committee, your state committee party. And they can certainly put you in touch with someone who might have run the campaign in that state and have the conversation with them. Like, as I said, as I indicated, I've done that with my state uh, U.S. federal delegation, uh, senators and representatives. I'm not completely done. And they're willing to take that call. They want to seek to understand and they'll reach out to their colleagues to have an appreciation for what the National Infrastructure Bank is. And at the end of the day, it's about getting projects done now. Money is cheap, it, uh, interest is very low. In addition to that, it's 25 million more or less good paying jobs that all of Americans need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, with that, we're gonna move on to 
Representative Lisa Sebecki from the Ohio State House of Representatives. And Lisa is going to share with us how, if you're a legislator, how you can be able to hopefully be able to talk to your colleagues and hopefully be able to, to get them to sign on. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. And um, like I said, I'm State Representative Lisa Sebecki, and I represent the 45th House District here in um, Ohio. And where I live at is in a town called Toledo. And so um, what I've been doing is at my local le level, talk with my city council. Uh, they have passed resolution, talked with our county commissioners, they passed resolution. And then I've also been working at the state house as a legislator. And in the last general assembly, we had, I um, co-sponsored a house resolution. Unfortunately, did not make it through the process, but also currently now that we're in a new session, I am currently working on that resolution, but also what I call educate and mobilize. So I've talked to Republicans and Democrats and asked them to learn more. And I've set up, I'm setting up in the, um, in the coming days and weeks webinars to be able to have them be educated. So when I do drop my resolution that I have um, sponsorship on with that. And so that's been very successful and a lot of interest is growing around that and going to grow that interest larger and larger. So I'm first working in the house and then make my next um, educate mobilization will be on my Senate side. So I always believe if you don't have your, your own current family in order, you can't start um, trying to collect in somebody else's family. So I think it's vitally important that we have that discussion at the house level because it's vitally important in the state of Ohio, that we do have a national infrastructure bank uh, due to the conditions of our infrastructure and the um, broadband that we do not have within our, within our state and the high-speed rail that we always just almost get there, but never gets there. So this is the perfect time to be able to put citizens back to work with good paying jobs and I really am excited that there's so many people that are partaking in each and every one of these webinars to learn more. So as I'm closing, um, it's just that educate and mobilize. And that's what I'm doing here as a state legislator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Sebecki. <clears throat> Next up is Jason Parker, who is president of the Virginia State Building Trades, uh, Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, Jason, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. I have something on my screen. There we go. Um, Jason Parker, Virginia State Building Construction Trades Council, 30-year electrician, proud member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I'm going to take a stroll down memory lane, which some of the panelists went with me, um, walked with me on that, that path. Uh, on the summer of 2019, the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition came and gave a presentation in the mountains of Virginia to my council. And, you know, at first, everybody always has the same reaction, which is, wow, this is a kind of, to them, a, a very unique idea. And so if it hasn't been tried, there must be something. But as the council began to discuss it and become more familiar with it and a little more um, comfortable, I asked my executive board if, if they would give me permission to go out and lobby for this with the, uh, the coalition. At the time, we didn't have a bill, so it was a bit difficult. But we went out and we talked to people and we began to, that I began to help them spread the gospel, if you will. Um, as time went on, we moved a resolution through my council, which passed, which gave us a leverage to move a resolution through the, the, uh, the actual state federation, AFL-CIO. And, and, and the interesting component of that was, as we were moving this thing up the ladder, these resolutions and this interest in the National Infrastructure Bank, a lot of the, the regional councils began to, to pass resolutions. A lot of the local unions began to pass resolutions. And so now we sit with resolutions in the General Assembly and we're in session right now. We've got a very short session, 30 days, believe it or not. We have a couple of resolutions, one by um, Delegate Sam Razul and one by Delegate Elizabeth Guzman. And the nice thing about it where we're sitting in this, in this situation is, is that they have, we have the full weight 
of the AFL-CIO behind this. And so that gives us a lot of leverage to move the state in a direction where a resolution can move through that General Assembly and we can send a national signal out to those people in the Beltway. And just for us union members and, and union leaders, you know, especially in the construction trades, I know that NAB2 is kind of locked into that Beltway culture. They're locked into what they think they can get done through appropriations. And for the past years, rightly so. So it's kind of our responsibility to send out a signal to them that there is an appreciation for a different way to approach our infrastructure needs as a nation. And I just think that this is the right time. Um, and normally I would be harping on manufacturing and, and all those good items, but I think we've heard that story before from me. So I just encourage you, go out, push your, push your councils, get these resolution, resolutions through, get the coalition to these councils and let them talk to them. And I'm telling you, magical things can happen for your state and for the trades in the United States. Thank you very much, Jason, for that. <clears throat> uh, next up is Representative Eddie Pushinsky of the Pennsylvania State House of Representatives. Uh, I would ask uh, Eddie, uh, if you could please just, uh, if a constituent wanted to, it, it was to come to you with an idea, can you kind of explain the, the types of things you're looking for? I mean, I, I know you're on with this bank. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to, for people to, to think about is if they were coming to you, and you had no idea what would be some of the things that you think are very important uh, that uh, they need to emphasize to their uh, representative to get them to kind of open their eyes and look at this as a, in a realistic fashion. Well, how about three words? Jobs, jobs, and good paying jobs. That's four words. <laughs> How's that? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, everybody. Jack Cannon, it's great to see you from uh, the Democratic Party there did a great job. And of course, all those that came uh, um, made their presentations. You know, again, uh, let me start off by saying, you know, in the middle of difficulty um, lies opportunity. And if there was ever an opportunity, it is now. And what am I talking about? First of all, we have several pandemics going on. It's not just the virus that put us in the hole, the conflict between parties has now disrupted our political process. And I strongly believe that this idea, this concept uh, can bring us all together as Americans uh, because who wouldn't want to try to support legislation that's gonna create jobs, that's gonna improve the infrastructure in every state in the union. Pennsylvania is no different than Ohio. Our roads and bridges need work. Our water systems need work. And as a result, guess what? We don't have the money. Pennsylvania probably be in a hole about three and a half billion to four billion dollars. I strongly suspect every state in the union is in the hole. What does that mean to their transportation budget? That means they don't have one. Now, where are they going to get the money? So the only way that we can bring our country back on so many, from so many different problems and on so many different angles is this concept of work. We come together as Americans. We come together as members of our communities, members of our unions, our trades, our electrical, our plumbing, our concrete, the whole nine yards. That's how we come together and rebuild America, putting people to work. The, the um, house uh, right now in Pennsylvania, we just had uh, three days of session. And although we didn't do a heck of a lot of work, uh, there's a little different feeling. Uh, there's quite a bit of a, um, an untrustworthiness throughout. Once again, when we have this difficulty unsettling uh, situations, this concept can bring us together. Uh, I have been working, by the way, Rick Blumendale, who's the president uh, of Pennsylvania's PSC, um, AFL CIO. He and I spoke uh, earlier in the week. He's completely on board and will uh, help with our other unions. We have, of course, many members on the Democratic side, and now we are starting to get members on the Republican side. We've also made inroads in our Senate, and we've also had conversations with Congressman Matt Cartwright and Senator uh, Bob Casey, both of which are from Scranton, by the way, which is where 
Joe Biden was born and lived there for about 10, 12 years. So uh, I'm going to work hard and I would strongly recommend that anybody that's on this call, think about the concept of being able to provide not only 25 million good paying jobs and those jobs then do what? They pay taxes, what else do they do? They buy goods, they pay rent, they buy houses, that money comes back into the economy. Not only those 25 million jobs, but the infrastructure that we need. Uh, Pennsylvania needs a heck of a lot of stuff. You know, we could use three lanes on Route 81. We have distribution centers with plenty of, of uh, transportation vehicles that is always tied up because it's two lanes on each side of the road instead of three. Our transit system needs it. You know, and when we talk about Pennsylvania, we need broadband. Our rural areas, the western, southwestern, midwestern parts of the state have little or no broadband. These are all doable projects that will present uh, and uh, will not only present a better quality of life, but it creates a better future for our kids. So I'm totally on board. It's a matter of us trying to find some simple examples of exactly what this will do for the betterment of everybody that's in America. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much for that, uh, Representative Pajinski. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Catherine Borgia uh, from the Westchester County Board of Legislators. And what Catherine is going to hopefully discuss here a little bit is how on the local level, if you're in office, uh, you can be able to try and, and recruit and be able to talk to people on the other side of the aisle and trying to get the idea moved forward and then uh, hopefully pushed up to be able to adopt this. So, uh, Catherine, thank please. You. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. So, um, I am from Westchester County, which is the suburb that's just north of New York City. Um, we have, uh, we are an old part of, of the nation. We were settled in the colonial time, and a lot of our infrastructure is from the 19th century and early 20th century. So, even though we're considered to be a very wealthy, um, part of the world. And in fact, there is a lot of wealth here in Westchester County. Our infrastructure is very much in need. So when I, st I, I heard about this resolution through Tom Carey, who's on the panel as well, and uh, who is the head of our central labor body, this was the kind of thing that I thought, wow, this is really going to be helpful for us. I chair the Budget and Appropriations Committee. And just as, as recently as last Monday, we passed about uh, $45 million worth of needed infrastructure repairs that we're going to borrow for. So um, this is something that can really help every part of the world. And I think um, in getting my colleagues to care about this or to see this as a benefit to us, I really spoke to what they care about. You know, this is the kind of thing that could help us fix our old roads, bridges, sewer systems. We all know that we need those things to survive as a community, but it also is something that could help us build a green infrastructure, which many, many, many people in Westchester County are advocating for not only here, but around the nation. It's something that could help us with the in economic injustices. So that's where I go when, I, when people who are more concerned about um, the economy, the local economy, especially with COVID, when I speak to members who that's their main concern, I talk about that. So I think it's really just a question when you're talking to your colleagues about hitting them where they are, saying, what, what's your pet project? What's the thing that you want to see? What's your moonshot idea? Because the infrastructure bank is a way to actually get some of the things that we think are too big to do. And we're a dense, well, we're an interesting community because there's a lot of dense areas of Westchester County, but there's lots of rural areas too. The pandemic has shown us the huge cracks in our society. And it's embarrassing to be in a county that with a $2.1 billion budget with a million people where we see kids on their mother's phones in the library parking lot because they don't have access to broadband. So if you care about justice, if you care about education, all of these things can be, um, can, this is a useful tool to get them. So when I talk to my, to my uh, colleagues, what I'm really saying to them is, listen, 
This, this is the way to get what you want. This is a tool to get what you want. And when it's described to them, I, I've, I've had some pushback. My, uh, my legislative body actually just recently, or a, couple, a year ago, became almost completely democratic. We only have one um, a conservative party member. And frankly, she is an extremely good legislator who understands this completely. She's the least of my worries. But within my within my uh, within my caucus, there's a lot of people who are like, well, that's to this or that's to that or, you know, how are we going to pay for this? There's a lot of people who are budget hawks who don't understand that this is actually the solution to budget problems, not the creation of budget problems. So I agree with a lot of what's been said here. It's education, but it's also really hitting people in their heartstrings. You know, we, we, a couple of speakers have said this already, but we're in a time where people feel very uneasy, very uneasy, and they want to see a bigger, better, shinier America where we're more living up to our ideals, where we say, we don't only say we're the greatest, but where there's things happening, there's things being built, we can see the future coming to fruition in front of us. And this is a really excellent tool to get that done. So I have introduced a resolution in my, in my um, legislative body. I've also spoken to many of the communities, local communities in Westchester County to ask them to look at it too. And once you start talking about this and you start uh, getting excited and, and telling people what can be done that they really care about, I think it's actually not a hard sell. It's, it's something that, you know, you can point to history and that helps people understand it. But once people do understand it, once people do understand that they'll have access to the resources to do the things that are so important to them, that's the way, that's the way I find. I think as legislators, as elected officials, even at the very local level, and the local level is a really good place to look at this because we're the ones who get our hands dirty, literally. We're the ones who run the sewer system. We're the ones who have to repair the roads after a snowstorm. We're the ones who have to do all that stuff. Um, it's very, it's very easy to to convince people that this is a good way to go because it brings us all together doing tangible things that we know we all need. Plus, it's a way to have our dreams realized. So that that's what I'm doing. I'm storytelling. I'm explaining. Some people need more details. Some people need more story. Some people need more, um, you know, a tutorial on exactly how a public bank works. Not everybody's a historian. Many people in the legislature are historians, but not everybody. Uh, some people really care about how is this going to help my local stores and uh, can you know, and explaining that fixing infrastructure is a way to get economic development for the whole municipality, as well as bring jobs into the municipality, you just have to bring it back to what people care about. So that's what I've been doing at the local level. I also am part of the uh, convening committee of Local Progress New York. So I brought it to a lot of other communities in New York. It's there's a lot there's some there's a lot of excitement about this. So very exciting to be part of this panel, very exciting to be part of this project and hoping the first hundred days is when is when it comes to fruition. So thanks for all that everybody is doing for this. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's exciting stuff. And, and you're absolutely right. It's about the storytelling and being able to find out what's important to, to people uh, and being able to make sure that. The other thing I would say is that uh, if anyone out there is able to uh, uh, get a web uh, would like a phone call or, or do be able to do a zoom for a specific legislator or a group of people uh, the the committee is the coalition is more than willing to be able to get on and to be able to do that so that you don't feel if if you don't feel you have the expertise we can make sure we can get the experts on there to be able to make the presentation directly to uh, uh, different areas. So always keep that in mind. It's something that uh, we here at the coalition are more than happy to do, and, and we continue to do that uh, going forward. With that being said, uh, our next presenter is uh, Erica White, and she's president of CWA Local 4319 in Toledo and also vice president of Northwest Ohio AFL-CIO. So Erica, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone, and happy new year. A lot of exciting things happening. A lot of crazy things happening also, but I always try to have people remember that when we're almost there, right? That's when the balance of things are a little off, but we can be excited where we're headed. So A. Philip Randolph said over 40 years ago that the essence of trade unionism is social uplift. And that is so important as we think about this national infrastructure bank. 
because social uplift for unions is just that and we're talking about jobs and not just any type of jobs we're talking about wages that are family sustaining wages because let's be honest there are jobs out there right now correct um there's all types of jobs they talk about but if you have to work two or three jobs is that really taking care of your family and when we look at things as such as um child care and being home with your family it doesn't matter what type of job you have if it's not sustaining your family. And we talk about that again, healthcare, and not just also having benefits, but having access to healthcare. And we talk about industry standards. Again, that is all part of trade unionism, that's social uplift. And so we're very excited about that. And those are the seeds of grassroots movement. That's how we move people, okay? So you don't have to talk all the fancy stuff. You know, I, I, I love Alfeca. I love listening to her, but I can't be Alfeca. You know, I, I, that's hard. And that's when you do want to get people like that on the phone. But I can definitely talk what my um, people that are, whether Republican or Democrat, when we talk about people having, whether we look alike, that doesn't, it's not where we are. It's where we are socially and economically in this country. And we have a lot in common. But when we're talking about hey, I have to work two jobs just to take care of my family. I, I don't have health care. I have health care, but I can't even afford it. Or that I don't, where I work at is unsafe. I haven't been able to get PPE or I'm wearing the same mask over and over again. Those are simple seeds of this grassroots movement that people get. And you don't have to use fancy words for people to understand that. Now, when it comes, we've been a CWA. Um, here we passed a resolution or endorsement from our unions, our membership. We've also been working with our state council, which is our, um, which is just in Ohio. We're looking to come back in that in March. It's not something that is go always going to be easy, and we have had um, Alfeca on to talk. Also, Jason Parker. We brought in other people because I can speak what has to do with the simple seeds people understand, but there are other parts that I'm not able to speak on. So, but we have to get this bill through. There's always going to be people that are going to stand in the way of getting things done. And that can't stop you from getting things through. Okay. So if anything, my big thing is remember who's been the most affected. When we talk about women, when we talk about blacks, black and Hispanic workers in this country, very simple just to go and talk and bring up those simple, I call it just living standards of what people are going through. You don't have to make this hard as um, representative. I, I, can't see his last name, I'm sorry. Representative Eddie, I'm sorry. I uh, wasn't able to write that down really quickly, but as he said, to call and talk to, I have um, worked a lot with my estate rep, uh, Alisa Sobecki, uh, Representative Sobecki, and we, we call and we talk um, at least once or twice a month. We would need to do it more, but of course we're both trying. She works on her side as a pol politician or one of our representatives and we come together how can we make this message where people get it so you're going to have to have that one-on-one -on -one talk find that person that will listen to you and have a conversation and a connection it's not hard it's not going to be easy <laughs> but we can make this happen and it does have to be a grassroots effort but if you remember those seeds living wages people that can sustain their families health care not only having it but having access to it and industry standards that protect our families. And the biggest thing is going back to what everyone said, as these are our communities we live and work in, they need to be rebuilt. We need water, we need bridges. So that is so important. Simple, simple things to talk about, just table talk. I call it dinner talk. Things you can talk to your neighbors about, talk to your family about. So let's get this done. I'm excited. Um, don't forget to wear your week. Um, fellas, you can wear pearls also. There's nothing wrong with wearing pearls. We will not judge you, just like if you wear pink. Um, I'm very excited where we're headed, but we've got to be ready to do the work and not just sit back and let things roll by. Thank you. Oh, and um, what was it? Go Buckeyes, OHIO. Got to make sure I give a little love for Ohio out there. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Um, next, we have uh, Councilwoman Janet Diaz from Lancaster City Council and PA. So, uh, Councilwoman. Yes, uh, good evening to everyone. I am um, very happy to talk about this infrastructure bank. I spoke with um, Stuart probably in the beginning, that would be about a year and a half ago when he brought it up to city council. We finally got it through. 
the resolution number 40, 2020 in September the 8th, we had Alpaca and also Stewart at city council for the committee meeting and day that we went ahead and, and we voted on it. I feel very strongly about it. Um, we are right now in Pennsylvania where we have to separate our storm water and our sewage water because of overflow. And it's important to have the funding and it's in a very expensive thing that we're going through whereby everybody now is having to pay fees. And unfortunately that is, that's really hurting a lot of our people that um, due to COVID, they are either lost their jobs or they haven't even received their um, unemployment because it's been held up for one reason or another. I think it's really important when I look at this is the fact that just like some, of, some people have already mentioned broadband, especially out in the rural areas. But most importantly, the school's um, infrastructure, we have had a lot of problems where there has been so much lead in the schools where we had to shut down the school. And right now we're trying to rebuild one, but unfortunately we don't have as much funding as we wanted with all the other schools that have also the same problems with um, lead. We need affordable housing. Um, right now, Lancaster City is a very small city. We're very short on housing. And we're not looking at uh, housing that's costing some people, you know, $150,000 just to get a condominium. We're looking at just trying to have a small apartment that's going to be affordable, which is between five to $700 a month because they're only making a minimum wage. Now, in reference to unions, I really am very strong in supporting unions. I was in IBEW for 10 years and I continue supporting them. They supported me through my Senate race, which importantly fell short, but the fact that I got more connections with the unions, it was really important for me to also um, explain to them about the infrastructure bank and how we, we can recover from the economy. We can make changes um, across the board, not just on the democratic side. I do sit on the uh, executive board for the um, democratic state um, party they have already sponsored this bill, which is really um, exciting, especially for Stuart when he, when he finally told me that it was factually passed. So I think that it's really important for all our legislators, no matter what side um, of the political aisle you're on, it's important that we have jobs. It's important that we're able to maintain people's in their homes instead of having more and more issues with homelessness like we do in Lancaster. Um, we don't wanna continue seeing people with mental health um, due to the loss of jobs and also their homes. And, you know, unfortunately we have seen where people have overdosed and have just, just wasted their life away with, um, you know, drug addiction and alcoholism. So, when having an opportunity to have the infrastructure bank able to help all across the nation, we're gonna have jobs, we're gonna have businesses that are unfortunately right now they're closing, but we'll have, you know, be able to reopen them and, and bring in, you know, all across the United States, you know, the vibrant um, United States that's always been here that bring people from all over the world to visit us because you know, we're the richest country in the world, but unfortunately with COVID and everything that has transpired these past two weeks, it really has put a dent on the separation of trust and, and being able to, you know, respect our legislators as well. And um, I just feel that very strongly, we, we, we're going the right direction with this, um, with this bank and, I hope everybody comes on board. I'm excited. And if you have any questions, you can reach me at uh, Lancaster City Council and I can share with you, um, you know, what we put together as the resolution. Um, so thank you again for your time and take care and God bless. Thank you, Councilwoman Diaz for that. Uh, we have two more presenters and then we'll get to your questions. Keep them coming in. Uh, some of them are getting answered online, but we'll make sure the answers get read uh, uh, live here also for the people who aren't paying attention to that. Uh, next is uh, Peter Taylor, uh, who's chair political act and political action committee and past president of the C Central Georgia Labor Council. So Peter. 
Right. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this elite panel. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, my part in this is, is very important, and I feel real good about it because it's got a lot to do with union members and uh, union labor. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm supposed to be talking about uh, how to get the union member involved uh, with this National Infrastructure Bank and getting them to understand the meaning and what it's all about and what it can do for union members. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, uh, that we get the information out to them and let them know the subject matter and the facts about how uh, this bank works and how they re how it relates to them as union members. Also, we want to make sure we present the facts, and we want to make sure we present the facts orderly, concise and in a positive manner so that everybody will have an understanding of how it works. And not to get too much offline with the information, but make sure we stay with the facts. Uh, and once we present the facts, we want to relate the facts uh, to uh, each member uh, and the similarities and what they mean to them uh, in a way that is not difficult for them to understand. And, and in so many ways, we try to make try to make sure that they understand that we all, uh, even though we're different, we still have similarities, but not so many differences that they, they take away from where we really need to be. So effectively identifying the facts of the material, and especially with this HR 644, and how, and how it would be prevalent to all union members and working people in general. As I see it, though, that anyone that has ever been a wage earner at any length of time, and I say any length of time, five years or, or, or better, most of the time you, you get invested uh, with a company. And and some of the cornerstones that, that make this happen is uh, being able to be punctual uh, on that job, being credible, reliable, and dependable. With HR 6422, that can be possible. Of a good vehicle for good paying jobs to help different union members to reach that goal. Further, we have seen uh, over the last four or five decades, and, then, and, that, and I'm not saying that because I've been around a few years, uh, that we've seen the highs and lows of our economy. Uh, some may remember uh, union contracts that uh, had good, good benefits as well as high, high pay raises uh, even so much as up to uh, eight and ten percent annually. I dare to say, though, that uh, those uh, days are well uh, by us. Uh, but the facts of HR six four two two will give credence to and for millions of Americans and lots of union members to have good jobs and have Davis Bacon wages. Uh, without that. Uh, with the National Infrastructure Bank uh, and that information being put out there through the unions and through the labor councils and through the Georgia AFL CIO and any other means necessary, we want to make sure that uh, this that this level of sustainability uh, reaches our union members and depending on uh, and not being able to have to depend on the government uh, for handouts or uh, uh, other areas that they that they don't need to you know participate in when we can do it ourselves. Uh, this would make, uh, and also, we we love the the opportunity for apprenticeship programs for jobs as necessary, and as 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 a present though HR six four four two two, with the Georgia State Council of Machines and Aerospace Workers, we presented this. Uh, uh, material to them back in October of 2020, and we endorsed it. And we are very happy that that happened. Uh, they could see the benefits, the very positive benefits, and, and they outweighed the negatives on how much better that it would make the communities in Georgia in all areas. Uh, today, we believe that HR 6422, as presented, gives the best roadmap to more stability for a better working America. And with that, uh, I was able to uh, speak with one of our new 
elected a, a, a representative for D.C. and that Mr. John Ossoff, and, and during his campaign, I did uh, speak with him about the Nas National Infrastructure Bank, and uh, he did give some exciting uh, input that he felt very positive about it and believed that it would work in a very positive way. So we're excited that we got our new representatives in D.C. to represent Georgia, and I want to make sure that I get to be a part of making uh, a history being with them on making sure that we get uh, the National Infrastructure Bank off the ground and running and get as many people involved as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Those are some positive developments and uh, uh, very well put. Um, our last presenter is Ryan Snow. Uh, he's chairman of the California State Legislative Board of the Brotherho Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, the IBT. So Ryan. Well, thank you. I, I can, that's a pretty big mouth. Um, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of thinking why, <clears throat> why I'm here. Um, and um, we talked about what, what I was uh, supposed to say. So I'm going to say it. Um, you know, um, we're talking about these infrastructure plans. And as you see, you've got the, uh, the high-speed rail in front of you on my, my name chart there. A um, little bit about the e economic impact of the California high-speed rail project. Um, through the designing, planning, and building of the nation's first high-speed rail system, it's already stimulating job growth across the state. Um, they've already hired uh, 7,900 full-time jobs. Uh, these are good-paying jobs. We've helped 539 small businesses there's concrete, there's steel, there's rebar, there's the transportation of these materials, there's computers to purchase, there's parts, office supplies. The, the, the manufacturing process of the, 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 the project itself is just mind boggling. I've, uh, I've been uh, driving a lot through the pandemic from uh, Bakersfield to Stockton. I live in Bakersfield, California, and I mean up to Sacramento. And, um, I've gotten to see this thing being built. And it's amazing to see through the pandemic, it is charging forward. Um, so um, just one more thing, and, and I know it's been a long day for most of us. Um, this thing puts more money back in through, um, with the, the, the workers, the purchasing of these products, um, all these infrastructure projects, that, are going to just stimulate this economy like no other. And uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. Um, now on to the questions. If you, again, if you have any questions, uh, please make sure you uh, uh, put them in either the chat or the Q&A and we'll try and get to them as best we can. So we're gonna start off with uh, a number of the questions uh, have been asking about, uh, is there a clean energy uh, language in the bill? Uh, are there, uh, in, could it partner with the Green New Deal, et cetera? And I'm going to give a couple of people an option to, to go after this. And I'm going to start with Senator Lou De Palma. Uh, thank you, Bob. In fact, yes, while we're glad the person brought up the question, uh, while presenters were going through, I did review the bill. I brought up HR 6422. And if you review the bill, you'll see clean energy mentioned at least twice. And so I posted that in the uh, uh, in the Q&A area. With regards to the comparison of the uh, National Infrastructure Bank and the uh, Green New Deal, I, I'm not able to answer that question because I'm not up to speed on the, the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal was a resolution. Uh, obviously, the uh, National Infrastructure Bank is an actual uh, bill. There was another, one other question I'll, I'll answer as well quickly, Bob, because I looked. question asked about nuclear energy or nuclear power. Uh, there was no reference to nuclear power in the bill. All righty. Thank you for those answers in order to do it. Uh, there was another one from Bobby Beavers, uh, who's retired Maine state rep, and she and uh, they're looking for a copy of the resolution uh, from, from Virginia, and I see Jason's going to get that to you. But I will tell you this. If you were to visit our website, uh, www.nibcoalition.com, uh, there are copies of the resolutions that are on the website, 
and uh, also that can be used as templates to be able to, to use for all different aspects from the local government to your union, uh, to the state government, uh, and to a, a, any trade association, et cetera. There, there are all kinds of examples out there. So you'd be able to do that. Also, if you need a copy of the bill itself, that also is on the website and, and you could read it specifically there. And there are also a, a quick um, a summary there to be able to do it so that you could get the quick answers that you need. There's a frequently asked question or quick answers uh, that you can go on there to be able to, to get those simple answers uh, again. So uh, I would encourage you to do that as we go on. Um, uh, with that being said, uh, Alfeca, one of the questions was, uh, they, can you explain how the initial capitalization of the bank uh, occur, uh, will occur in simple terms, please? Yes. So the, the important thing is to think of this public bank as being very similar to a commercial bank. Uh, a commercial bank that takes in deposits and gives out loans mm -hmm. is actually able to create the money uh, that it gives out in the loans. That's uh, part of its accounting process. So this work, this bank works in exactly the same way. And what you need to open a commercial bank is you need to have it capitalized first. The capitalization is sort of a rainy day savings fund that can be used in case any of the loans go bad. There's a big uh, economic downturn or something like that that'll keep the bank afloat. And normally the uh, requirement is that you have to have $1 in capitalization for every $10 that you lend out. Since we're going to lend out 5 trillion, it means we need 500 billion in capitalization. And we're going to take, we're going to uh, acquire that capitalization by buying in these treasuries from the private sector in exchange for preferred stock in the bank. If you wanna see, a, th there's a little flow chart that we've done of, of how this bank actually works. Uh, and again, if you go on to our website, nibcoalition.com, and look for a document called Quick Summary, it'll explain all the steps of how this NIB works. And I'd like to also take really quickly an answer to the previous question, the overlap between the Green New Deal and the National Infrastructure Bank. We did do a comparison of the, those two set of objectives. After AOC came out with the Green New Deal, we compared all the objectives of that uh, proposal with our bank and coverage. And it turns out that the NIB covers all of the objectives of the Green New Deal, that is clean water, clean air, providing jobs, you know, retrofitting houses, uh, uh, fixing transportation problems, all those things. The only thing that it doesn't cover is moving electricity generators off of fossil fuels and onto a renewable energy very quickly. If you did that, we, we found a later costing uh, estimate came out, you'd need an extra $3 trillion just to do that one job, which is not covered in our NIB right today. Um, we could talk about it a little bit later and how best to finance that, but uh, there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot of strong overlap with the NIB, we call the, the legislation does call for using green materials, using uh, uh, the latest technologies to save on energy. And our biggest thrust is to put in rail in the center of the transportation mix because rail saves a lot of energy to move passengers. Thank you. Thanks, Alfeca. Uh, uh, well, can I say something about the Green New Deal and the infrastructure bank? Um, one of the, you know, normally I would talk about bringing back manufacturers and we lost 70,000 manufacturers. And one of the things that I asked the Green New Deal crowd is this, if we, in a closed loop system called planet Earth, if we have them over there in China and other places utilizing the worst of business practices to produce the things we utilize and, and we build this infrastructure and bring those manufacturers back to the United States of America and use best practices right there, you'll be, call, you'll be saving a lot in the overall human carbon footprint on planet Earth. Absolutely, great point, Jason. Um, with that, I'm gonna move on, change uh, tax here just a little bit. Uh, somebody said that uh, Biden was making his presentation and asked uh, where we were in terms of uh, being able to do it. He's talking about infrastructure so far, but hasn't uh, uh, talked about the infrastructure bank. So Jack Hanna, if you wouldn't mind sharing your answer uh, to that question, that'd be great. Thank you, Bob. Yes, um, uh, the NIB coalition has been in constant contact uh, with the uh, Biden campaign, 
since uh, July of last year, uh, when the uh, uh, platform was being drafted, uh, which initially only mentioned the, the National Infrastructure Bank once, and due to our lobbying and efforts, uh, we were able to have a uh, language included uh, in the final draft of the platform that increased the profile of the National Infrastructure Bank uh, and it included several sentences uh, supporting it. Uh, since the election, uh, the coalition has been uh, in regular contact with the Biden transition team. We have thus far met with the Biden transition team twice. And uh, it was represented to us after the uh, inauguration, they're a little bit busy right now. Uh, they're going to circle back with us and continue to obtain information and hear our advocacy with regard to the merits um, and the benefits uh, to all the country the, in a bipartisan fashion and manner, which they're going to need to have, regardless of us having just a margin of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of a uh, uh, support from one party to another. So thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, <clears throat> looking at uh, some of the other questions that are on here, um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, uh, getting uh, the apprenticeship involved, et cetera, Jason, uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about how uh, the bill has that potential to be able to do it and how uh, this could help us to be able to refocus uh, what's currently going on with our school system, where it's all about college prep, et cetera, to be able to refocus them on, on being able to get into skilled trades. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, when it comes to the skilled trades and everything like that, it, as far as this, this will bring a lot of people into the disciplines of construction trades, but it will, it'll do more than that. Those disciplines will also transition into those factories that bloom from those places, and it will revitalize a lot of the um, rural areas, those, you know, those one factory towns that kind of collapsed in the loss of all the manufacturing. And I think Peter really did a great job talking, and in, in when I, I envision like the youth, and especially our young members in like the apprenticeships, he did a really great job on the outreach to those members, and that would obviously include all apprentices and, and, and those being trained by the trades or those being trained for a job in a union space. Can I add to that also? I, I think, and I, I want to just add what um, my brother Jason said. And it also brings about the, the thought that the trades are only just, you know, you work in a factory or, or you're only going to be an electrician or that. I work for at and and you cannot get a degree in telephony engineering. You know how you learn about telephony engineering? You have to go to AT&T University. You know how you get to AT&T University? AT&T AT &T University, you have to get hired in as a unionist in a union job, and then that's how you go. So even getting a, getting a better grasp, this allows that, because we're talking broadband. Those jobs where people, it was this thought that you look down on trade the trades and you look down on apprenticeship programs. There are people that have jobs like myself and like Jason um, and like um, Ryan on this job that make, we make really great money. I mean, we make great wages, great living wages with benefits. And that's without a, having to have a degree. So we even wanna make sure that we're getting in there and we're talking what that looks like, what a real apprenticeship trade looks like because having going to school for four years with AT&T and having a, a telephony um, engineering background you can't get that going to college. Some things you can only get through an apprenticeship program, and we need to be pushing that more through schools. So this allows that, and it also changes the concept that it's just a job that you just do and you do not want. These jobs are desirable, and we need to stop, you know, be able to change that, I guess I would say, that portrayal or that misportrayal that trade jobs or apprenticeship jobs are something that you don't want. They're just something people that go to school, they get them because they can't go to college. That's what, something that's allow us, us to change and challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Uh, I was gonna, uh, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I was gonna chime in too a little bit on that because it's, it's really, you gotta take it back a little bit further though too. It's when kids are in that uh, entering high school or even junior high level uh, and, and Erica White started touching on that is that relationship with your public schools, there was a 
the time back in the day when you had those um, career tech um, job, okay, because there was that, that push towards the college. And that's also, you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna have people that is um, working in the trades currently, but we're also gonna have to have that, those kids are gonna be starting school, those kindergartners, actually they're starting now, that's gonna graduate when? In 2033. So we have to um, have them prepared because we're also going to have the main take maintenance of the infrastructure so we don't get to the positions that we are in currently right now, looking at just starting a baseline of $5 trillion. So I just thought that was a very important point that we um, bring back, just bring it back a, lot, a little bit further, bring it back to the kindergartner that entered school this year. Very good. Thank you that for, for that, Lisa. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Rep. Pashinsky, uh, there, there's some several questions about affordable housing and, and and how the bank could be able to do that and the demand that's for that. Can can you talk a little bit about uh, the need for that and how uh, you could vision uh, the bank to be able to help with that? Are you still with us? How's it and, now? There you are. There gotcha. we go. That helps. Okay, what I started to say is um, affordable housing is in as bad a shape as is many of our roads and bridges or lack of broadband. So uh, the, the, this NIB concept is so important now because it will provide the money that's necessary for not just the roads and the bridges, but for a decent living space. That decent living space improves the quality of life for those children that are being grown up in those and raised in those uh, uh, housing units. Therefore, it improves the entire uh, ambiance, the uh, aesthetic value of the communities. And as a result, it, you know, we heard the, the phrase, all boats rise uh, together. That's exactly what's happening here. So um, the construction of, of affordable housing that is a uh, quality living space is as important as the broadband is, as important as the streets and the roads and bridges and the transportation. And uh, once again, uh, they brought up health before. When you have the dollars, you can afford the proper health care. And when you have the proper living space, uh, that also helps as well. So it all comes together uh, that improves the life and quality for all people. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Janet Diaz, would you like to talk about this too, please? Sure. <laughs> um, in planning and going forward, I think it's really important for us um, in reference to the green um, new deal. I know that we can't completely stop the, um, the shelling because there are other, that would be losing jobs, but moving forward, there's, you know, we can use plans to, you know, build energy um, panels, things that would help um, to reduce um, shelling and, and, and cleaning up the air. Um, so that would be another way. I personally had pushed and tried to push in city council to ban um, styrofoam because I know that there, has been case studies um, done in the University of Massachusetts that um, you know styrofoam type of um, one use product is something that causes autism, diabetes, um, cardiac issues. Um, so that's something that we also should look into. And I think you know with the infrastructure, I'm sure that we can move forward into creating um, you know billiards and other things that are that are um, solar, you know, solar panels uses. Um, that's what I think that we can um, concentrate on. Um, but in reference to the new green, the new um, green deal that I think AOC had mentioned, uh, that's that looks like it's more of a larger and maybe longer term 
um, in the future, maybe building more, you know, having, um, you know, apprentices uh, regarding building um, battery generated cars. Um, I know that there is a company in California, if I'm not mistaken, that they also are building planes that are going to be battery operated as well. I think they may have had one or two already um, produced. So those are things that we can look for the future um, with the infrastructure bank, but I, I can't narrow down exactly how that would um, work. But for sure, I, what, I'm, what I'm really excited about is, you know, having union jobs, having healthcare, and what, and, you know, people be able to have enough food on the table, roof over their heads, so they're not working two or three jobs, um, because that's what is occurring currently. And I really want to see people to, to have the ability to be at home with their children and not having to work so many jobs that they're so exhausted that they wind up in the hospital over exhausted from work. Thank you very much uh, for that, Councilwoman. Uh, we're going to get into the point of start wrapping this up to make sure that we can do it. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, <coughs> Catherine Borgia if, if she wouldn't mind kind of summing up uh, what she sees. She did a very good job in her earlier presentation to talk about uh, the passion uh, on how to be able to make this happen. And, and I think that's a really good point that needs to get wrapped up. And if you wouldn't mind kind of bringing us to that point, I'd, uh, I'd really appreciate it. Sure. So I think what we've heard today, this has been a great panel discussion for me because ah. I think it brought together a lot of ideas that I, I hadn't even thought about thinking about the infrastructure bank and why we needed to support it at the local level. And what I think you see here is that this is a tool that can be used for so many different things. The pandemic has showed us two things, I think. The desperate cracks that we have in our society, where things are, are falling, um, you know, falling apart, falling, making it impossible for people to live decent lives. We've heard a lot about that today. But then the other thing is the opportunity, where, where we can reimagine the future, how we can see things be better and bigger and, and more equitable and more just. Um, affordable housing, are, that's a basic human need. Education is a basic human need. These are the, this is a tool that can help us get our, the people that we represent, the people that we care about, all of America, the country that we all love, um, to be, the, to live up to the ideals that we have. And what I love about it, honestly, as somebody who comes to government from a business point of view originally, is that it's smart. It's a smart way to do it. It makes economic sense. It makes social justice sense. It makes practical sense. And that's why we really need, I think, to all band together to have people not think about this as some kind of wonky policy thing, but really as a way to rebuild our country. And people are desperate for that. People want to believe in the future. We're all shook up by all the things that are going on right now and how far apart we are. But the, let, the thing that brings us all together, I think, is that feeling of hope and also a plan for how to get there. And this does both of those things. So that's why I am very excited to be part of this project. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Peter, if you wouldn't mind giving us a summary on what uh, people in labor can do right now in order to push this forward, in order to bring that segment to a close. Yes, uh, people in labor right now can contact their councilmen and their representatives at the state level and make sure that they make the point very clear uh, that this would not only help on the local level, but it help on the state and national level. If we get more union members involved, and, and since you asked me to kind of sum it up a little bit, uh, we do have a very, very large uh, battery company from South Korea building right now in the state of Georgia, uh, a $2.6 billion investment, as a matter of fact. And also, they will be hiring uh, two point, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2,600 uh, workers, uh, but I haven't heard exactly whether they will all be union members. I wish they were, so I'm checking on that to make sure. I always want new union members and get union members involved, but I believe that would be the first step in making sure that we get them uh, involved in making contact and talk uh, seriously about this and get excited about it. Thank you so very much. All right.
Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the resolutions page real quickly so that we can see it here and kind of go over it. <clears throat> All right, so if you, if you take a look at this, these are uh, the following states have introduced resolutions in support of the, the National Infrastructure Bank. And uh, some of the states have passed uh, through one house, et cetera, the ones that are marked in uh, red letters uh, indicate that the resolutions are being introduced in 2021. So uh, you can see that uh, this has uh, broad appeal and we are trying to reach into every state. Uh, we are asking if you're on the phone and you're from one of the states that's not on this uh, um, list, uh, please contact us so that we can help you to be able to get a resolution so that you can be able to get it introduced. If you are from one of the states that has it on here, please reach out to uh, your member, uh, uh, your local member or your, your state representative and, and encourage them to make sure it gets passed and encourage them to continue to do it. One final question that was continually asked uh, uh, was, do we have a Senate sponsor yet? And as of today, we do not have a Senate uh, partner yet to be able to do it. We have continued to reach out to them. Uh, if anyone has the ability to be able to do that, I know things will change now because the Democrats now will have uh, the chairmanships and uh, we'll have a new group to hopefully reach out to, to be able to do it. And this will be an opportunity, I believe for the Democrats to be able to work with Republicans, to be able to, to make something that happens. So uh, please work on that uh, if you would. Um, and to uh, bring us all to the final conclusion, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel that, uh, if you haven't seen any of all of our videos, uh, there are ones that talk about uh, the mechanics of it. Everything that goes on there, there are webinars there that you can go on and, and view at your pleasure to be able to do it. However long it takes or doesn't take, uh, you can jump in, jump out and be able to do that. But there, there are uh, all kinds of them that are out there. We've been doing it since uh, August and continue to make that happen. And uh, also visit our website again. Uh, with that, uh, I, I appreciate everyone's time who came and decided to share their expertise on here and your passion. Uh, I really think that we have a plan here to be able to make uh, the National Infrastructure Bank work for America. America needs it right now. We have been in a situation where we are all feeling economic insecurity. Republicans are feeling it. Democrats are feeling it. Americans are feeling it, and we have to figure out how to be able to give people hope again. And this National Infrastructure Bank, in my opinion, has the possibility and potential to be able to make hope for all communities a possibility. And that's something that uh, I really feel that we have to do. But it's not going to happen by us just getting on these webinars to be able to do it. We have to get it down. We got to get our hands dirty. We have to do the hard work that has to be done. It's not hard, but we all have a small step to do, but we all have to do that step. Uh, we can't all do it by ourselves, but every one of us can do something. And that's the thing that I want to leave with you here tonight. Do your small part, whatever it is, to push this uh, through. And, and hopefully within 100 days, at the end of this uh, 100 days with the Biden administration, the light will have dawned and we'll have a national infrastructure bank. So keep on working hard, people. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.